and what I'm going to be doing quite regularly is I'm going to be doing sort of um, updates. So I would consider myself to be an alternative uh, anatomist, alternative, you know, uh, um, um, a casual scientist, if you like. It's been a growing interest of mine over the last few years. So uh, my main interest is in um, functional movement, human movement, and how that gets represented in um, the world of anatomy, which it kind of doesn't really. And what got me thinking about this morning was I'm going to be going on a um, podcast with a, a really interesting uh, neuro guy tomorrow night, and I'll put that uh, that up when I'm when I'm when I'm done. And looking at some of his questions, it was thinking, well, you know. This is really good stuff that I need to answer, but I also need to answer it in more detail. But today what I'm doing is I'm just wanting to um, highlight uh, something that popped up this morning, which I thought was really interesting, um, that is um, a health matter. And I wanted to sort of quickly discuss it, if you like. And that is that we've had a, um, a big surge. Um, there's a, an article that came out uh, in The Guardian today, which was which is talking about this, this big surge um, in um, cancer on, on the rise of um, under 50s and we don't really you know we don't really know why that's the case so um, what's happening here is that um, we're seeing um, it's still pretty rare so there's some good sides and some downside well not good sides to anything of it um, but um, as the article says that um, it's great great going old but one of the downsides it tends to be an, an increase in cancer um, now for the majority of people the, the the good news is for the majority of people um, you still it's still quite rare if you're under 50 to get cancer so if we put this into context um, then um, cancer research tells us that the, between the um, early 1990s and, and uh, 2018 um, the cancer incidences increased but um, that's the, the point about it is this is that we are still it's still very very rare um, under uh, under the age of 50 and accounts for sort of 95 percent of people um, over the age of 50 in fact over 70 75s, uh, 50 percent of cancer affects the over, over 75. So, um, 90 percent of all cancers affect people over the age of 50. So it's rare. So the thing I want to start off today is is talking about um, um, just briefly to remind ourselves about the difference between incidence and prevalence because it's quite an important thing. So um, and that it's the way that we measure things um, and how we come up with things and also you know what's the incidences of things and how often do they happen. So most people I know we we get frightened by the word but most people aren't going to die. Um, of cancer. Now, many people will die with cancer, um, and some people won't even know they've got it. You know, particularly things like prostate cancer. But most people won't die um, of cancer; they'll die of something else. And so, you, what you look at is you look at um, the incidence rates. You look at say how many people in, in a in a population of a hundred thousand um, get X, Y, or Z. You know, whether it be ingrowing toenails or um, um, cancers. And then you can work out uh, what the incidence is. And then you have this population. This is the prevalence of it. This is what we're talking about, a, a burden, the sort of the global burden of something. And that's where it becomes really, really important in, in, in terms of understanding what it is that we're dealing with when we're dealing with um, certain certain types of cancer, the burden, you know, how, how much does it um, cost society to support people? How much is the treatment? Um, what are the ongoing issues of individuals uh, when they're experiencing the cancer? How much support are they likely to need um, in terms of getting around or you know irrespective of the outcome of the cancer and so you know we can go to say skin cancers which aren't likely to be um, particularly lethal that's quite rare in this country that skin cancer uh, will, 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 will be, be fatal and then we go into things like that are a little bit more serious like um, pancreatic and colorectal cancers but the interesting thing is is that most of the can the cancers that you hear of are of are, are other which is weird so think of a, a cancer that you can think of you know esophageal or um, or lung cancer and then all the, the majority of them come into this um, this sort of category of as a set of uh, of other so let's go back and have a little look at this um, at this article that, that came in and see if we can um, sort of make any sense of it. So the article this morning um, was was in The Guardian um, and it talks about, you know, it says the upsides to growing old. Um, and then it, um, it talks about this grim trend, um, cancer, uh, pe uh, people under the age of 50 becoming more common. Um, and so the number of people under 50 being diagnosed with cancer worldwide rose by 79%. Now, again, you've got to remember that what you're talking about is 79% increase in 
those people within that populace. So I, I don't know what the incidence rates of, 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 of cancer are. Um, and this is going to be cancer of all kinds of cancer are um, in per 100,000 of, say, um, uh, liver cancer. Um, but supposing, supposing it's, it's, it's 25 in 100,000, okay? Again, just off the top of my head. And then what you're looking at is you're looking at an 80% increase of that incidence rate. So you're saying, what is 80% of 25? And even if it's 100% 25, it's another 25. And so if you said it's doubled or what have you, which it hasn't doubled here in this instance, it's saying it's 80% of the existing um, incidence rate. So, you know, let's just say it's 100%. So that would mean that you've got 50 in 100,000 rather than 25 and 100,000. That's statistically quite a significant leap, but it's still, you still got to take that into uh, account. Um, and we've seen this before and when you've had um, things that, that, that seem scary, like eating sausages will, you know, quadruple your risk of cancer. And, and you know, the statistics and the, the research bear that out, um, but the quadruple is quadruple of the overall risk. It's not that if you go out um, and eat and eat sausages, you are four times more likely. There is an already an incidence group. There is already a population per hundred thousand. And instead of it being you know ten or twelve, it's now fifteen or twenty. Again, that's quite significant. But when you look at it, but when you look at it in a bigger picture, it isn't as as, <laughs> as doom laden um, as you think. Um, so the um, the, the cancer is rising rapidly and it is a, it is a scary thing to, to consider. And the, um, this is a, a, a very short um, article in the, in, the, in, in the Guardian, in the newspaper. And of course, it will be interpreted in lots of different ways as far as lots of different um, news outlets are concerned. Um, and then you've also got another review um, um, in, led by Harvard. And what it's showing really is that um, in the Western world, particularly in, in well-developed nations, we're seeing uh, this increase. And, and then the question is working out, working out why. Now, again, this article goes into here to say um, these risks had established links to cancer such as obesity, inactivity, diabetes, alcohol, smoking, environmental pollu pollution and Western diets high in red meat and sugars. And then, of course, you've also got a shift work and lack of sleep. So a few of these things are worth having a little look at. Um, and um, it's something that if you haven't heard me uh, speak before and you, you know, you don't know me, you know, I'll say it a lot is that cause and association um, are not the same thing. So if you have a, a situation whereby um, you do something, it may cause something. So if I drop a an anvil on my foot, the anvil will cause me um, to uh, break my toes. Um, and probably, and so therefore the association of anvils dropping on toes is, and, and, and breaking toes is very high. You know, jumping off a building without a parachute is, is going to have a, a cause which is fairly straightforwardly known. We understand that, that what that risk is. It's a fairly narrow uh, frame of reference as far as the risk is concerned. But once we go into um, other things, the, the, it, it's not as, as simple as that. Um, and I you always like to use the analogy of... Um, um, uh, wearing sandals causes people to um, eat ice cream. You know, so you say, well, does it mean that if I wear sandals, I'm, you know, more people who wear sandals are eating ice cream? And it, what's the association? How have we got there? So if you looked at it, you'd say, well, uh, people are more likely to wear sandals in the summertime or when the weather's good. And also you are more likely to possibly be outside eating ice cream in the summer. And so you could say, that there was an association between um, wearing sandals and um, eating ice cream. I mean, don't know whether they're with socks or not, <laughs> but but it's not a cause. There is a, an association there, and so the associations of things can be strong or, or they can be very weak. And and sometimes we, you know, w these associations um, we struggle to understand what they are necessarily. A few years ago, there was a, a study. Many years ago, there was a study in Japan um, that looked at. Um, heart, heart, death from heart disease, and it had one of the lowest um, heart disease rates in the world. Um, and, um, it, you know, it turned out that it was more about reporting. People were looking at, at dietary links. And when you take those people out of Japan and put them else, elsewhere, they had the same uh, level of, of heart disease. Um, and it was to do with the societal view of, of heart disease and how 
it was sort of considered to be shameful and people therefore didn't, you know, doctors seemed not to report it. Um, another one was um, the drinking of red wine and, and lowering of heart disease um, amongst people. And of course, we looked at phenyl, phenols and, and, and all those other things. And, you know, of course, it turned out back in those days that people were more likely to drink wine if they had more money. And money is always going to be the single biggest factor that's going to determine your health outcomes. So, so association and cause you have to be looked at. So a big one people might think of is diabetes, type 2 diabetes and obesity. Does, type, does obesity, obesity cause type 2 diabetes? And the answer is absolutely not. The association is there and there is a, a, a strong association, but you can have people with type 2 diabetes who aren't obese and you can have people who are obese who aren't, don't have type 2 diabetes. And so you can look at that as well. You know, cancer and smoking. Does smoking cigarettes cause lung cancer? Um, and the answer is no, it doesn't cause it because that would mean that everybody that smoked cancer would get lung cancer and they don't you know and, and but the association is very strong and then there's loads of other um, health factors that go in there as well you know and for uh, you, you love those stories where people go well you know my granny smoked 80 cigarettes a day and she lived to the age of uh, 96 and my argument yes is but for every one of your granny there's another thousand of uh, people who died horribly at the age of 65. So it's about cause, it's about association, it's about looking at what those risk factors are. And um, But when we start to take global patterns and global trends, you can start to see a big, um, a big um, movement and a big change. And one of the things that happened a few years ago, back in the 70s, was that um, there was an, a big incidence and a big increase in, in heart disease rates. And, and people were you know, worried about what was going on with that and why. Um, and, and a government, uh, the American government, commissioned a man to go and look at it. And what he said was that uh, he found was that um, saturated fats were, were contributing to heart disease. And actually, when you crunch that data, that wasn't true at all. Um, and, and the association was very, very poor. A chapter called Ansel Keys. There's a whole you know, load of stuff on it you'll find on, 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 on the internet. It's all out there. But what happened as a result of that was that there was a massive big swing to people trying to cut back. It was always low fat and, and, and reducing fats and, and uh, trying to reduce these cholesterol levels. And cholesterol is just something that's produced by the body anyway. You know, it's not the cholesterol as such. It's, it's the triglycerides, which is another story. And what then happened was that was that once you take fat out of things, a tendency is for them to be uh, a little bit bland. You know, you've got a, the mouth feel that goes with with having fat. And so therefore, the tendency for people a lot of the time uh, was to lean on other things to make the flavor come up, which is the, the sugars and the salts. And that's when you can look at the spike of, of heart disease um, and you can see that what's gone on is that it's increased and diabetes and all those kind of things have increased since the 70s in particular. Then you also had this trend towards people who, um, again, particularly, um, and we've we've picked it up over here, particularly in the United States of America, who were going down this idea of, of of fast or processed foods and the convenience that they offer. And as societies have changed over the years, what we've seen is that there's a there's a big difference between. Um, the, the economies of people who are, uh, have obesity or large weight factors or what have you um, is the fact that you, you have a, a shifting weight. You know, go back to Dickensian in London and the street urchins were all skinny and the wealthy chaps were all, you know, portly gentlemen who got out of carriages. And now what you see is that there's a, there's a socioeconomic shift, if you like, that's changed and that now we have the patterns where uh, we tend to see that the, um, the, the people on the lower socioeconomic scale are the people that will um, tend to be more in the way of obesity and other health problems that go alongside that. Again, it's not just the obesity. There are a whole other load of behaviours that go in alongside that, including um, alcohol, lack of uh, activity, uh, possibly poor shift patterns and, and the eating of, of, of the, the thing that we're going to talk about next, which is the ultra processed foods. So avoid avoid one one behavior or one group as as the as, as a blame if you like it's not helpful it doesn't it doesn't really work in that way so the next thing that in the same the same um uh, article and it sort of says at the top of this we just go back to the top of the article it sort of says um, now we have to you know we, we have to key task is to work out why and within the same day's page what we had was uh, ultra processed foods the 19 things everyone needs to know and the thing about ultra processed food let's zoom in on that a little bit is that um it's it's everywhere you know it's 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 
I, I don't consider myself to be somebody that eats a, a lot of ultra processed food, but I like a sausage um, and um, I like a bit of bacon, you know, and, um, you know, occasionally I'll have a, a, a burger. And so if we look at this here now, um, as it says, it says all, old, all food is, is processed to some extent. So but even if you cook from scratch, um, you know, we'll use olive oil and flour and what have you. Um, but the stuff is the, you know, look down the side of the packet, the stuff that we're talking about here is stuff that you're not going to have in your in your kitchen. Um, and um, is it is it is it unhealthy? Um, it's an industrially pro produced edible substance. And there's a reason for this. Let's let's go back to uh, the big one that is uh, still a problem um, just on its own. And it's hydrogenated fats. Now, a lot of the um, manufacturers, food manufacturers, have, have cut out using um, hydrogenated fats in their or trans fats. Sometimes they're referred to in their in their in their products. I think uh, Marks and Spencers have cut them completely. Not sure about Iceland. I think they were planning on doing it, but doing it, but um, I'm not really not really sure. But let me know. Um, and so the, the the trouble with trans fats um, is that they are they are very poisonous. They're sort of like sucking toxic sludge through a bendy straw but the reason that they're in foods is because the, the biggest evil in terms of food manufacturing um, is um, waste so throwing stuff away once you throw stuff away or you have a shortage of short shelf life it means that your costs will will go up you know you, you have to produce it it's you know double cream for example um, yes you can pasteurize it and, um, and and it keeps a bit longer but you know it's not going to have a great shelf life there's not much you can do and so therefore somebody might come along and make that stuff I'm not sure what they do with it but um, they stabilize the fats so fats are always the things that will turn something rancid so hydrogenated fats are where the fat is heated up to a very high temperature, about, I think it's about 1,000 degrees, and then it has hydrogen put through it, and it becomes very, very stable. It becomes a sort of a, an amorphous fatty lump. I think I've been called that before. And, and so this amorphous fatty lump is, is now very stable. It can be used in stuff that's you know, going to be stored at high temperature or low temperature, um, and it's not going to go in, go anywhere. It's, you know, it's not going to overfreeze. And if you bake some cookies and you've got butter in them and sunflower oil or what have you, it's not going to be a couple of days before those those cookies, those biscuits aren't, aren't really edible anymore. But once you have those fats stable, you can put them in a packet and you can leave them on a shelf forever. You know, so if you've got a packet of biscuits, um, you, you know, you take them out and they're not stale. They have a shelf life of two years. And so those things will be hydrogenated fats. And, and the body really, really struggles um, to, to deal with those things. Um, and in the United Kingdom alone, uh, we have, um, the, I'm not sure of the last, the last figures, but we have in the region of 300 to 350 people a week who are dying prematurely uh, from trans fat poisoning. And that's not, they're not my words. They're not a dramatic uh, use of phrase. It's, that's, that's, the, um, that's the, the terminology. So if we go back to our, our, um, our ultra processed foods, the thing is, is that and this is what it says is that it tastes delicious. Ultra processed foods taste delicious. They are great. You know, we don't we're not eating them and going, yuck, that's disgusting. Um, for a lot of people, they are, you know, they're yummy. They, they're great. And they represent um, um, a lifestyle, they represent an, a capacity to be able to eat that they wouldn't otherwise be able to eat. So. Here's what it does is it, it raises the risk of high blood pressure, heart disease, heart attacks and strokes. So this isn't this isn't the cancer. This is the, the this is a, apart from this. This is ultra processed foods it has to have, you know, stuff that's going to stabilize it, keep it there, give it you the mouthfeel um, and, um, you know, showing us how, how harmful it is. Um, a high consumption of um, ultra processed food is linked to obesity, cancer, type 2 diabetes, depression, dementia and tooth decay, amongst other conditions. So, again, it's not just the, the cancer involved. And um, uh, the, the uh, found, uh, study, uh, this is the shocking thing. 50 percent of the average UK diet is made up of uh, UFP and among children and poorer people, it can be as high as 80 percent. You know, that's a frightening thing. Why? Because. Think about it. You know, if you're a if you're a, a single mum, uh, perhaps, and you've got a couple of kids, or you know, at home, and you're, you're working a couple of jobs, and uh, you can't afford, you haven't got the time to go out and buy ingredients and 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 cook them and and, and create something 
um, even if you knew how to, and the education on this is, isn't as high as it used to be. And so what do you do? You go down to the supermarket and have a little look next time you're down there. Now, Asda have got some two for ones as far as their fruit and veggies concerned, but it's very hard to, to get a, a, a basket full of fresh ingredients that you're going to home, home cook um, that's cheap. Um, and so you, you look at the two for one pizzas, you know, you can get pizzas in, in Aldi, Lidl and, and Asda, and then you can get two pizzas for a couple of quid. And so you can really stack up on very, very cheap filling um, foods and baked beans, all these things. And these are ultra processed foods. These are foods that have all those associated uh, uh, risks. So. so the question is, how do we know if I'm eating uh, ultra processed food? And um, we, we don't have the health warnings, but um, is it, you know, the, look out for the, for the, the health claims. Um, and uh, does it contain palm oil? This is a, 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 another issue that we've got. Um, is it made by a multinational company? That's, that's the point. Uh, that's really uh, the, what you've got to think about. Did that company start uh, with a cheap crop such as a lentil and turn it into lentil puffs? I love lentil puffs. They're great. But they're, they're ultra processed foods. And those are the hallmarks. This is where you can look for. Um, um, I'm a great fan of a man, a chap, chap called Michael Pollan. Um, he's got um, um, a program, a series on Netflix. It's been out for a few years now. And it's called Cooked. Just Cooked. That's the name of it. And there's only four episodes in it and he covers um, air earth fire and water the elements and he talks about um, our relationship with food and how we've become um, programmed to think of um, convenience as being a, a sort of a right um, and in another talk he gives he talks about a mcdonald's potato and i'll give you the story of michael pollan's mcdonald's potatoes you notice that they're sort of you get a, a, a basket of those chips those fries in mcdonald's and they're very long and they have to sort of stand up straight. And so in order to get those potatoes, they, they come from a specific potato. And that, this is called uh, the Burbank Russet. You know, my little storage of information, the Burbank Russet. Um, and it, they're very hard to grow. Um, and um, they, they, they are subject to um, an aphid, which causes something called net necrosis. And if you've ever cut a potato in half and you've seen brown threads running through the potato, that's called net necrosis. It's, it's harmless in terms of eating it, uh, but McDonald's won't buy them. Um, so in order to get rid of this net necrosis, they have to spray this um, potato with a, um, a insecticide. And I think the insecticide is called um, Motion or Notion. I'm not sure which, but either way. And after five days um, of, of, of and once this has been sprayed, the five days is the period of time that those um, farmers cannot go into those fields. There's, there's so much degree of toxicity that those farmers can't go anywhere near those fields for five days. Now, when the potatoes are harvested, they're pulled up out of the ground, they have to be stored in huge atmospheric warehouses for six weeks before they are edible. They are not safe to eat until um, six weeks after they've been pulled up out of the ground. And that's the McDonald's fry, ladies and gentlemen. So that's the interesting thing. And um, um, at the end of this talk, Michael says, uh, Pollen says, um, what's been studied is that is that people, particularly in poorer communities, women who cook um, and who know what is going in have better health outcomes than um, other women, irrespective of their wealth, which is a really big change because generally speaking, we see that that money is one of the big indicators of health outcomes. But here's a, a curveball to that statistic that people that cook um, and, and know the, the, the provenance of their own food and put their ingredients in have better health outcomes uh, than people that don't, irrespective of wealth. Now, I haven't got the data on that. I haven't found the paper on that yet. Um, but, you know, as soon as I do, I'll let you know. So it's really interesting that over the years, we've sort of said there are no bad foods, but now there's kind of a list that's coming up. And if you don't recognize, you know, what that food is, if you haven't got that in your cupboard, if you've got, you know, guar gum or whatever it happens to be, then, um, you know, the chances are um, it, it's not something that is able to be made without it being ultra processed. Um, I, I bought a, I was camping recently and I bought a jar of, um, of tomato sauce you know i thought oh, it's going to be quick and cheap i'll just chuck it in and 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 there's this there's this feeling this mouth feel to it it was sort of slimy uh, and, and i i couldn't get my head around it wasn't like it's thickened if i put some corn flour into something and i can thicken it that's different but this was a sort of a slimy um, texture to it that was just disgusting and, and, and i had to sort of keep keep pouring <laughs> go and get better tomatoes and, and add things to it 
So it's just weird that, that, you know, I suppose we get used to it. Same thing with, with diet drinks. You know, there's that flavor to it, the, the fizzy drinks, it's a flavor to it that just tastes weird. So what are we looking for the label? Um, this chap has written a, um, a, um, a useful guide. And he says that um, uh, of how to, what they are and how to um, um, find them. So have a little look at this, this, this is list. This, this list is great, you know, hydrolyzed protein, soya protein, isolate. These are all these things, high fructose corn syrup. We don't really have high fructose corn syrup um, in the UK to any great extent. Um, you know, outside of Brexit, then, then look for that. Um, and uh, concentrates, things that invert sugars. And there's about 30 different names that I know of uh, for sugar, um, maltodextrose, all these things and different um, modified oils, hydrogenated or um, in, in interestified um, <laughs> oil. Uh, that's another, another subject. So um, cosmetic, as cosmetic additives um, made to uh, put into, to make the thing look better, um, flavor enhancers, colorings, emulsifiers. And we know individually what a lot of these things are gonna do, but we, we're not really sure about what the, the combined um, uh, um, effect of these are going to be or what the long-term effect of them are going to be um, bulking carbonated foaming and um, gelling so um, you know th that's it so UK flour um, is, is routinely fortified with calcium um, and we have cornstarch that's fine um, you know ascorbic acid um, but um, unlike modified starch you see modified starch um, then yeah, that's where we're going so um, do we have time to read every label in the supermarket? Um, my answer is, I, I don't think so, and, and I don't think we should. But I think if you're picking things up and reading labels, then then and that um, accounts for a bulk of your shopping, then perhaps th there's too much stuff that's coming in a packet. And I always give people the advice about, you know, people say, well, what should I eat? I'm like, well, you know, eat what you like. I, I, I don't have any... Um, any bang, a drum to bang as far as what I think you should do. I think we should all eat less meat because um, it's environmentally a better thing to do. And, and I think probably health wise, it's a better thing to do as well. Um, but that doesn't mean to say I think we should all be vegetarian. I think, you know, possibly um, if we could be vegans, then great. But a lot of the ultra processed foods that are now coming out as vegan foods um, are just that they're ultra processed. You see, you see a a, a a a vegan burger. There's a lot of stuff in that. You know, do you make your own vegan burger with black beans and breadcrumbs? And if you don't, well, you know, you're buying something that you don't know what's in it. So I always say that if you shop around the outside of the supermarket, if you if you think about it, all the junk, all the crap is in the middle of it. You know, as so you go down the uh, as you walk in through the front, generally the the fruit and veg is is close to the front, and you go down the back, and there's you know often the uh, the fishmonger and the butcher down the back, and and then you know the alcohol is always down the back as well. Don't miss that bit out. And then maybe some frozen food, some frozen veg or what have you, and then you've got the uh, you've got the checkouts. And so all the stuff in the middle is 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 the stuff that is going to have this kind of stuff in it. And if you look at it, it's very clever because this is what they'll do. There's a there's whole psychologist involved and they have the bog offs and the two for ones that will lead you in. So at the ends of aisles, you will have things like um, olive oil and the oils and the, and, the, and the herbs. Herbs are always at the end of an aisle because a lot of us will need herbs and spices we'll go to the herbs and spices and then we're in that aisle and then there'll be something else that leads us on um, and then next to the herbs and spices there's a packet sauce a packet gravy um, and that was the other thing i tried it was like a, a a taco spice mix and it was like it just had this emulsifying stuff anyway and then you follow it down and then suddenly you're in the aisle and, and then before you know it you've got you know you're cooking sauces and what have you and and there you go there's purgatory and um so so what, what isn't um, ultra processed food? And uh, this classification um, it talks about there's sort of different levels of it, different categories. And um, so category one is an unprocessed or minimally processed food. So fresh frozen, dried fruit, vegetables, milk, plain yogurt, fresh meat, fish, um, grains and legumes, that kind of thing. Um, your lentils, mushrooms, eggs, flour, nuts, seeds, pasta and couscous. And then you've got a category two, um, which is something like butter and vegetables oil. Now, so you can't really, you know, if you take, think about butter, it's been processed, it's been um, churned, um, and the, you know, the, the whey's been taken out, the, the, the milk liquid has been taken out to leave the milk solids. And so that is a processed food. And um, similarly to maple syrup, you know, you've got to do something to it. Um, and so you can't really, you know, an oil, you can't just take the sunflower, you have to press it and process it. Um, and, um, you know, obviously it's going to be the more you pay for it, the better it's going to be. 
And then you've got your processed foods, uh, things like freshly made bread and cheese. And freshly made bread and cheese is really, really important. And, uh, um, you know, because it's going to go through a process. But we'll come to that in a second. Um, cheese, again, you know, there's, there's a whole process that goes through it. Uh, tin food, like a tin of tomatoes is, is, is a tin of tomatoes. If it's got basil and garlic and something else in it, then it's been processed a little bit more than just the tin tomatoes. And they're going to be grades to it. Um, fish, fruits, cured meats, and smoked fish. So the um, the the top offenders in the um, the ultra processed food are the uh, fizzy drinks, um, and I, I'm I never cease to be amazed as to how many people can put you know put diet drinks down their throat and 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 go oh it's okay because it's a diet drink. It's like my goodness, it's just just ghastly stuff. Um, packaged snacks sweets chocolate ice cream biscuits cakes pastries sausages and burgers look at all that stuff this is the these are the offenders that that we you know people like to eat chicken nuggets packaged pies and it's children a lot of the time that are being targeted you know once you get the children once you get at the children um you know no matter what it might be whether it be cigarettes chicken nuggets um you know ice cream or religion get them and then you then you've got them hooked that's it they're, that's where they're at and so it's it's hard to get them off it so it's um uh you know and there's a there's a great picture that 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 that, that illustrates it that they put in here as well so it's 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 worth um let's zoom back out there there it is it looks great um and every so often, you know, harmless, nothing, nothing wrong with it, we might say, on, on, on an occasional basis. And that's the key to it, is that the occasional thing is always going to be fine. I like a sausage occasionally. Do I have sausages and bacon and, 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 and black pudding every day? No, I don't. Um, it, it's about the, the, the capacity to moderate our intake and understand that, you know, eating these things isn't going to give us cancer. That's not what anybody's saying. Um, eating these things is not going to make us unwell. What we're saying is that the large, um, the increase overall of people who are um, who are eating these things on a very regular basis, not exercising, are associated with other morbidities, comorbidities, uh, such as uh, obesity and uh, um, um, and type two diabetes, are the people that are then more at risk and so so you know if we look at as i said over 50 years and we look at how the lifestyle has changed and we look at what environmental factors are going to be and as, as well as another one um the um we're, we're not thinking like hopefully nobody thinks those are health foods um the um ultra processed food category also includes most bread yeah and the reason being is because of this um, thing down here, which is the Chorley wood process. And it, what it means is that you can turn around a loaf of bread in, in, in short order time. So you go to a supermarket and you buy, oh, there's some sourdough, sourdough on my backside. You know, I take, make a loaf of sourdough. Of course I would, because I'm a middle-class Guardian reader. And, and uh, you know, it takes me 24 hours because it, it, it's, it's a very involved process. Even the process with yeast is still gonna take several hours. Um, and uh, so we have to be careful of, of of going down. Oh, it's a it's a wholemeal loaf, or it has multi seed, or what have you. Um, and it, but it's it's very indigestible, and it's some um, it's, it's an ultra processed food. We're reminded of things like muesli, um, which I don't like anyway. It always feels like um baby foods. Yeah, loads of baby foods into there. So um, there we go. Shredded wheat is um is not ultra processed. Um, plain microwave rice. Um, some supermarket ready meals uh, including many lasagnas again it's got that sort of texture to it that i, I just can't abide it just it does my head in um and um the the organic stuff tend to be the same thing for the baby's food well again it's expensive and so that cuts out um the populace of, of those people who just you know can't afford to do that so um what can i snack on People are going to look at this and go, oh, I hate this. I, I don't have a sweet tooth and I'm really, you know, blessed in that regard. So I'm as likely if I go into the kitchen to grab a handful of cashew nuts or, um, or you know, a bit of cheese um, uh, or a lump of carrot than I am um, a, a sweet thing. I don't go for biscuits and I'm very, you know, um, fortunate like that. So it, it's, it's tough because we're addicted to this stuff. You know, it tastes good. There's a mouthfeel. Cadbury's chocolate has only got about 26% cocoa solids in it compared to say that dark stuff that you get of 75 or 80 um, and the rest is fat it's vegetable fat and it's designed in that way to make you want to be addicted to it you know when 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 craft foods 
um, were, uh, many years ago, Kraft Foods were bought by Philip Morris, the tobacco company. Um, and what they did was they got the scientists of, of, of addiction from Philip Morris to come over and apply the same science to foods. And they took Lunchables at Kraft Foods and they made something that wasn't doing very well into one of the biggest sellers that Kraft had ever had. Um, and it's about fat, sugar and salt. And there's lots of different ways to get you. And some of those strap lines, they go out of their way to tell you, you know, Pringles. Once you pop, you can't stop. Why? Because it's designed to hit your taste buds and to hit your, uh, your, your pleasure centers of the brain in, in, a, in a very, very similar way than cla that Class A drugs do. I mean, I know this, is, this sounds silly, but it's, it really isn't. These are reward centers. And, and we will reward ourselves. And we, we can't stop. There's a reason why we say, oh, these are so addictive, because literally they are. And um, so, um, yeah, he talks about Doritos here. Flavored Doritos contain additives and uh, ready salted crisp don't. So there we go. Have a tin of pineapple. Um, I'm a vegan. Am I like? Am I likely to be eating a lot of ultra processed foods? Um, again, I, I you know I think you know we get confused about veganism, and I think you know a bowl of pasta and tomato sauce is is vegan. But again, it's those alternatives. You see a strip of something in a plastic packet, and it says facon, then it's been processed to 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 hell and back. You, you couldn't make that at home, and you wouldn't try. Um, so, so there we go. Um, takeaways, restaurants, fast food shops. Again, the breads are going to be coming from a Chorley Wood bread process and, um, you know, the, the chains we've mentioned, McDonald's uh, fries, and uh, you, you just don't know who's cooking your food. You don't have an agency. You don't know the processes that that food's been to in order to get there. And I think that's, you know, that's the issue. We are so conditioned to think, oh, you deserve it. It's a reward. And we then go out and we do this stuff and it tastes good and we stop. We don't think about it. Um, so, you know, um, fish and chips. Maybe, I, I don't know, fish chip, great. You know, that, that might look healthy, but again, you've got, it's a bought sandwich, and, uh, and as it says here, to be uh, avoided. So um, the, the, the summary of this is, if you think it might be uh, <laughs> ultra-processed food, it probably is, you know, but agonizing over the stuff is, is less important than your overall diet. So um, activity, um, increasing activity is important. And like it says, um, it's part, it, part of a healthy lifestyle, but you can't magically get rid of the ill effects of it, uh, of UPF in the gym, just as you can't cancel out binge drinking by going for a run. I know, it's never never good use, news, is it? Um, and uh, um, is this focus another kind of fat shaming? Again, no, it's got nothing to do with your weight um, or anything else. It's not about um, about about how much you weigh necessarily, and don't forget that this stuff, as he says here, is designed to be overeaten. You know, it's it's not designed for you to put your put it in your mouth and go, I don't, you know, I don't want to have any more of that. It's designed to make you want to keep going and keep going and keep going. And um, it's not about telling people what to eat or what they should or shouldn't eat. And that's not what I'm saying here as well. I'm saying just be aware of the fact that we are surrounded by this stuff. And it's really, really easy. Um, and the food industry has huge, huge lobbying powers to alongside, you know, pharmaceuticals and arms industries and tobacco industries that have a lot of interest in making sure that we're not as warned necessarily as we should be. And, and because it's food, we necessarily think if it's not making me ill, then it's safe. So and, and it, that's not necessarily um, the, the takeaway from this. So. There we go. Uh, a depressing uh, half an hour in my company. But I just wanted to say that. Remember, so the takeaways of this are um, incidence and prevalence are the same. There, there, there are different types of risk and that cause and association are, are, are different. Um, and that, um, uh, yeah, that's my name, keep bumming up. And that um, um, what we eat necessarily isn't necessarily what we eat um, on, on, on occasionally. It's how we look at our overall life and go, what is the, the main factor? What is the the feature if i was to look at a room and say right the theme of the room is red what's the theme of my diet you know how much of um am i eating um that is food that i don't have any control over um, and how could i get a little bit more control and sometimes we have to start little and often and maybe it's my kids i know it's really tough with kids you know they don't want to eat anything different they want you know junk and, and they like it but why, you know, why is that the case and how can we wean them off it and, and, and what are we going to do about it? And can we get them cooking? You know, it's it's about cooking. It's about having a relationship with food. Um, so um, thank you very much. I will be here on uh, Thursday evening 
at 7 p.m. And I'm going to be talking about a variety of um, different bits of anatomy. And I think tomorrow what I'm going to do is just start to talk a little bit about, you know, why um, my view, it's sort of going back to basics of, of why we need to think about the body as not being um, a collection of parts and how we need to put all those things back together again. So uh, please join me um, tomorrow evening. That's Thursday evening. That's seven o'clock um, uh, UK time, which is still British summertime. So wherever you happen to be in the world, um, then uh, please come and join me. And I will put, it's only for, I think, 20 minutes, half an hour. And um, I will put um, the resulting content onto Facebook and onto uh, YouTube. So see you then.